Hi everyone, welcome to my channel. I'm Kyle A. Thomas, theater historian and assistant professor of theater at Missouri State University. So this is the first video in a new series on my channel that I'm calling Excavating Drama, where we mine artifacts of the past for overlooked and forgotten evidence of theatrical practices. Since this series is just getting off the ground, I've decided to start by talking about a period of theater history that is particularly near and dear to my heart, the Middle Ages. I wrote my dissertation on medieval theater and drama, and there's definitely a lot I could talk about, so we'll see how deep this gets. But for this video, I want to address a common misconception about theater in the medieval period. Contrary to the story you may read in many a theater history textbook, the church did not swoop in and suddenly outlaw theater in the Middle Ages. In fact, religious communities not only preserved the dramatic traditions of their Roman forebearers, but contributed much to a growth of theatrical cultures across medieval Europe. Theatrical activity was pervasive throughout the Middle Ages, from liturgical dra drama in Germany to the mystery plays of England, and the widespread popularity of farces in France. Even the great William Shakespeare, as historian Helen Cooper argues, was the product of a medieval world. In my opinion, the Middle Ages may as well be called the Theatrical Ages. But there's a big part of medieval theater history that's often neglected, and unfortunately it's a common problem, found in some of the most popular theater history textbooks used in colleges and universities around the United States. In the history of medieval theater, scholars pay very little attention to the early Middle Ages. But why? Is there a particular reason for basically ignoring the middle seasons of theater history? Well, sort of. While trying to piece together the story of theater in the Middle Ages, scholars hold differing theories on whether a surviving document should be understood to be evidence of theater, drama, or something else entirely. Let me explain what I mean. It's incredibly helpful when a medieval document reads like a modern script or it describes activities that, to you and I, can be understood to be theatrical performance. Documents like that contribute a lot of important information to the overall story of medieval theater. And frankly, there are just a lot more documents from the later centuries of the medieval era that historians agree are clear evidence of theater. So in the history of medieval theater, it's like most of the early chapters are just missing. But is that really the case? Are they really missing? Or are they hiding? Side note, yes, of course, I know countless medieval manuscripts are missing, lost to time, gone forever. But I'm using this dichotomy because I like to think that all manuscripts are just playing hide and seek. And that it's just that some of them are still playing, like for a thousand years or more. Okay, so what I really mean to say is that yes, there's a lot more clearly identifiable theater in the later part of the Middle Ages, but that doesn't mean there isn't any evidence of theater in the earlier centuries. Take a look at this. This is a page from a manuscript produced in the early 11th century, the 1000s. The manuscript contains the plays of Hrotsvit of Gandersheim and was likely produced at Gandersheim Abbey in Germany sometime shortly after her death. You're looking here at the opening of Hrotsvit's play Paphnutius, a dramatization of the life and deeds of Saint Paphnutius of Thebes, an early Christian bishop. It's written in Latin, and the spoken dialogue is indicated by an abbreviation for the character or character speaking. For example, you can see this letter P followed by a mark called a punctus, signaling where it's intended that Paphnutius speak. On this particular page, you can also see where his disciples have lines indicated by each letter D. This formatting is maintained throughout the manuscript and in some places, there's also additional information included that helps us visualize the action of the scene, what we might call stage directions today. So even without a command of Latin, you can see that this document looks similar to a modern play script. And that sheds some light on one of the main difficulties in trying to identify documentary evidence of theater in the early Middle Ages. Do all plays look the same? We read that document as a play because to us, it looks like our modern theater scripts. 
But how do we really know it should be understood to be a play? Well, in this early medieval world, the invention of the book, what we also call a manuscript, was still a new technology. So really early documents were inventing formats that were copied over and over again throughout the decades. Hrotsvit was purposefully copying the way earlier Roman comedies were written because her plays were operating in a similar way to the Roman drama that she and her sisters were familiar with. After all, Hrotsvit and many of the nuns at the Abbey received an education in this monastic environment, an education where they studied the plays of the Roman comic playwrights of the classical era, namely Terence and Plautus. So, it's no surprise that Hrotsvit's plays borrow so much from her Roman antecedents. Let me show you what I mean. Okay, you're looking at a 9th century manuscript, the 800s, probably produced at Reyes in France around 100 years before Hrotsvit entered Gandersheim. The manuscript contains six plays by Terence and stands as an example of how medieval monasteries had been copying Roman comedies into newer manuscripts for centuries. Many of these manuscripts maintain ways to signal to the reader the difference between dialogue and narrative, which acts as one indication that the document in question was indeed a work of theatrical drama. In this particular manuscript, you can still make out the red letter abbreviations that tell us which character should speak the line. Rotsvit, or the women who created the manuscript of her plays, used similar formatting, among other things, that they learned from reading and copying early Latin dramas like this one. Side note, as with everything in history, it's all a little more detailed than that. Of course, Hrotsvit borrowed a lot from Terence. She even says so in her prologue, which I don't have time to get into for this video, unfortunately. I'll link to a great article by theater scholar Sue Ellen Case that analyzes Hrotsvit and her contributions to theater, including historical examinations of both Paphnutius and the prologue to her plays. Okay, so the manuscript containing Hrotsvit's plays is participating in traditions stemming from studying and copying Roman drama. But why did Gandersheim go to all the trouble and cost to create the manuscript in the first place? Well, first it must be said that Hrotsvit herself speaks of significant gratitude to the abbess of Gandersheim, Geberga, for supporting her and her work. Clearly, the community at Gandersheim supported their sister and found that her work was worthy of celebrating and sharing. They were the first to see the talent and promise in Hrotsvit. Decades later, her plays were copied more. A surviving manuscript from Cologne contains all of her dramatic works and another incomplete fragment housed at the University Library of Klagenfurt also contains portions of her plays. Even the original manuscript from Gandersheim eventually made its way to St. Emmeram's Abbey in Regensburg, Bavaria. While these surviving examples of Hrotsvit's plays prove that her work traveled beyond the confines of Gandersheim Abbey, we're not completely sure what the reasons for this were. But it's likely that as people traveled in and out of the monastery, many moving between other cloistered communities, some people took her work along with them. And just as Hrotsvit set out to write plays following in the dramatic tradition of Terence, but featuring Christian figures, morals, and symbols relevant to monastic education. It might also be possible that some of those individuals who carried her plays with them hoped to see her corpus amongst the works studied in the growing monastic schools across Europe. Many abbeys across early medieval Europe contained a scola, or school, where they could instruct younger brothers and sisters in following with the rule of St. Benedict and its insistence on study. One such Benedictine monastic school at Tegernsey Abbey in Bavaria employed the teacher and poet Fromund, who lived and taught at the monastery roughly at the same time that Hrotsvit was writing her plays in Gandersheim. In his writings, Fromund describes how he utilized performance in the classroom as a way to make learning more enjoyable. He also encouraged the study of drama, and Tegernsey's scriptorium likely produced several manuscript copies of Terence's plays. Throughout the Middle Ages, Monastic schools maintained and produced copies of Latin Roman plays because drama proved effective at helping students strengthen their command of Latin, develop oratorical skills for court, and added to a playful atmosphere for learning. Remember Hrotsvit's play that we were looking at earlier, Paphnutius? Well, the opening dialogue between Paphnutius and his disciples is essentially just a classroom scene. 
Paphnutius is explaining the cosmological harmony of the divine, using music theory based on mathematical concepts developed by the early medieval philosopher Boethius in his work De Arithmetica on arithmetic. So Protzfeed not only dramatizes the monastic classroom, she also characterizes the action of teaching and learning as a part of the saintly deeds of the church father Paphnutius. Protzfeed is writing drama for the classroom. Nearly two centuries after the deaths of Frotzvit and Fromund, Tegancy Abbey would produce one of the most unique plays in all of medieval drama, the Ludus de Antichristo, or play about the Antichrist, written around 1160. Not only does the play dramatize a global eschatological crisis complete with armies, kings, an angel, allegorical figures like Ecclesia, the church, and Synagoga, the synagogue, oh yeah, and not to mention the freaking Antichrist, but the rhetorical foundation for the dialogue of the play, the strong emphasis on emissaries and ambassadors, and the aesthetic focus of the play is centered on monastic education and pedagogy. But I'm going to hold off on taking a deeper dive into the play about the Antichrist until my next video, when we'll examine the aesthetic and performative influences that stem from monastic familiarity with the liturgy. In trying to find those missing early chapters of medieval theater history, Protzfeet acts like a signpost, pointing us to the environment in which she practiced her playwriting, the monastery. As the early centers of learning in the Middle Ages, monasteries were the locations where whole communities of people came into contact with concepts of classical or classically influenced knowledge, experienced as a part of pedagogical activities like drama, but also music, rhetoric, oratory, poetry, astronomy, mathematics, and more. This is precisely what makes a theatrical excavation of the early Middle Ages so difficult. What does a surviving document really tell us about its connection to drama, theater, performance, and all of the other things that it might teach us as a part of the medieval monastic classroom? Rotzfeet writes plays that, yes, show a deft understanding and creative riff on Latin Roman dramaturgy. But in the case of Paphnutius, Rotzfeet is also writing for the classroom to test or teach Christian cosmology, music theory, and mathematical principles, all in the container of a play. So, is it possible that other early medieval documents produced within the context of monastic education may have a relationship to drama that isn't immediately apparent from the document itself or the way it was written. Well, be sure to look out for my next video for more on that. Thanks for checking out this first video in the Excavating Drama series. Let me know what you think. Like and subscribe and all that business. But also check out the description below for the article by Sue Ellen Case, links to the manuscripts that we looked at in the video, and for a bibliography I used in preparing this. Thanks.